name is Robin Harrison. I'm the HRC Heritage Priority Area Leadership Fellow. Um, we have various members of our team here. So Susie Sanford-Smith, um, Colin Sterling, and Hannah Morrell. And um, we're very happy to welcome Esther Brightoff, who's going to be speaking to us later. Uh, Karen Buchanan from AHRC and Joe Dunster from AHRC, who will be taking over um, after me in a minute. So I wanted to just say some very quick things to welcome you first and say thank you for coming um, and to say some very quick uh, contextual things about the AHRC Heritage Priority Area, which this is a, a sort of activity that we're um, uh, running this workshop under the auspices of. So. Um, Several years ago now, HRC um, announced that they were looking to um, uh, appoint uh, leadership fellows for three priority areas, design, heritage, and modern languages. Uh, and um, I've, we've been uh, working on this priority area for the last uh, two and a half years, since the beginning of 2017. And um, the kind of role is to work with AHRC, with the heritage research community, and with various um, people in the sector, heritage sector, to stimulate a range of different kinds of research across arts and humanities, uh, which make a contribution to understanding heritage and its role in society, and to looking at this in intersection between heritage and uh, global challenges. And we have a very specific set of interests in connecting research policy and practice, both in the UK and internationally. Um, I also wanted to just flag this thing that many of you may know about, but some of you won't, which is um, the HRC Future Heritage Research Strategy. Um, so this is a, a kind of, you know, one of, one of the key points that I would make is if you are looking to submit a grant application to a funding body, have a look at what that funding body says the key priorities are. And, and this thing, this strategy is one, one particular document that you might want to look at and cite. Um, if you see particular resonances between the research that you're proposing and this document, you know, flag that to your readers and to your reviewers and to the research council so that that's uh, made clear. And these documents are produced in a way that, you know, these are your friends. This is written in a way uh, so that you can read yourself and the sort of work that you're doing and the interesting work that we see going on in, in a community. Um, into these strategic documents. So um, do have a look. These are the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight kind of core areas, but there's a lot of uh, detail under this, which are the research priorities in, in the strategy. Um, so that's it. I mean, I think probably most of you know about the, the um, priority area, but if you don't, we have um, our own set of themes, eight themes that we've been working on over the past couple of years. Um, and do have a look on our website if you want to know more about our, um, our work or speak to one of us in the team today about our work. And we have some upcoming activities, um, some flyers on the table about a conference that we're running in uh, two weeks' time in association with the German Historical Institute of London um, at their, in their building down the road here in Bloomsbury, uh, if you're interested. And we try to record everything. So we have a YouTube channel which has all of the kind of videos of all the presentations and our conferences and workshops like this one. We will be recording today, and I think you've been asked to sign off saying it's okay to be recorded. Um, we're just gonna be recording the talks, not what's going on at the tables. So, um, but, but it's possible if you ask a question, you may be uh, recorded. Uh, and we'll be uploading those to YouTube in due course as well. Uh, so welcome, I'm gonna pass over to Karen now, who's um, on the Histories, Heritage and Cultures team at, at the HRC and she'll be saying some uh, general things about HRC's funding for early career researchers. Thank you for having me here today. Um, so, yeah, I'm Karen Buchanan, I'm the Strategy Department Manager at HRC. So I mainly oversee the um, heritage portfolio. Um, I'm gonna very quickly run through these slides because it's quite a lot to get through in there time but um, just a very brief intro a bit of background information so as you're probably aware in April last year um, AHRC came under the umbrella of UK RI along with the other research councils and Innovate UK and Research England um, but we still have our own um, subject disciplines that we look after so there are around um, 50 disciplines so quite a, quite a lot um, and this here is just some information about our 
budget. Um, so the thing I always say here is that we have the smallest budget of all the research councils. We are the smallest research council in terms of our staff size. There's only around 60, 70 of us at the moment. Um, but because of our subject spread, um, arts and humanities researchers account for, I think it's around 30% um, of researchers. So the thing to say is we do an awful lot with the small amount of resource that we have. Um, and this just illustrates roughly where um, we allocate the funding. So the majority of it goes into open core research, which is our sort of standard um, funding schemes for research, closely followed by our support for postgraduate training and skills, and then the rest is kind of dispersed elsewhere. Um, so again, just, just illustrating some of the, the subject areas that we have. Um, as Robbie has mentioned, heritage is one of our thematic or priority areas alongside design and modern languages. Um, and we're also involved in lots of cross-council activity, um, increasingly more so since we became UKRI, just because it's, it's become a lot easier for us to, to do so. Um, and there are lots of things going on, so we won't cover them all, but the main, the main areas um, are mental health and environment and cities. So um, heritage, so we have quite a long history um, of our heritage portfolio. Um, so as Rodney mentioned, we appointed the Leadership Fellows in January 2017, um, but this built upon lots of other previous activity that we'd had that sort of led us to that point. So we've had programmes with dedicated funding, such as the Science and Heritage Programme, um, Care for the Future and Connected Communities, where they've all had a heritage element within them. Um, and we also have the heritage strategy that Rodney mentioned, which was updated in March um, last year. Um, the other thing to say is our, on a European and international scale, um, we are partners in the Joint Programme Initiative on Cultural Heritage. Um, so there's lots of heritage activity within there, plus funding calls, and also there's been lots of heritage calls through the Newton Fund and the Global Challenges Research Fund as well. So there, our portfolio is quite large in this area. We don't have a dedicated pot of money, but there's lots of activity going on in other areas that make up our heritage portfolio. Um, so just briefly, and I'll go on to talk about these again in a second. So these are um, the majority of our funding um, schemes. So as I said, we don't have um, a pot of money dedicated to heritage, but what we do see is lots of proposals coming through what is sometimes referred to as our responsive mode. So these are the schemes that are open. Quite often they work with that deadline. So we have leadership fellowships, research grants, networking. Um, Follow-on funding is if you've already been an award holder and you can get some money for some additional work around impact um, and engagement. Um, and then we do have thematic or strategic calls. So these might be one-off calls that we have in particular areas where we want to um, address a particular issue or concern. But all of the, the top the top list um, are responsive mode, as, as they're sometimes referred to, which just means that they're completely led by the researchers to apply for whatever you like, basically. Um, highlight notices, um, this is something we do where we might um, advertise a particular thematic area that we want to address, but through those responsive mode schemes. So we might say we'd like to encourage applications in X area, and there'll be, it's usually around six months that that might be open for, and it could be that we're then able to put in extra money to ensure that some of those proposals get funded. So it's a quick way for us to be able to respond to thematic areas that we want to address. Um, and then again, international opportunities, um, GTR, Newton, JPIs, and Pilbara. Um, so, um, this is our definition of an early career researcher, which is taken from the AHRC's funding guide, which 
very, very long document that tells you everything you need to know um, when applying for funding. So our definition is within eight years of your PhD or equivalent, or six years of your first academic appointment. And by academic appointment, we mean um, paid employment where there is an element of research or teaching in that post. Um, the employment status, it does vary depending which scheme um, you're applying for, so I'd make sure you check that quite closely. Um, so, for example, fellowships have this line about having to be employed for at least a year. Um, generally, the guidance says that you need a contract with an institution, but it has to extend beyond the lifetime of the award. So, temporary contracts are possible as long as they extend to that beyond the award. So, um, if you're in doubt of any of this, I would really encourage you to contact IHSC. We're very friendly and always happy to chat to people and to talk this through. But I know there's quite a big issue, particularly for early career researchers at the moment, about temporary contracts, um, which makes it then difficult for you to access some of this funding. But this is just worth bearing in mind that if the institution can guarantee your contract is beyond the length of the award, um, and they can um, maybe write something to support your proposal to say that, then a temporary contract is fine. Um, so just a bit more detail about some of the, the more relevant schemes. So um, the Leadership Fellows and Research Grants both have roots for early career researchers. Um, so the Leadership Fellows scheme, so not to be confused with the UKRI, Future Leader Fellows, um, that Joe's going to talk about, this is AHLC's own fellowship scheme. So um, this provides an opportunity for um, leaders, potential future leaders, um, to undertake some individual research, but also a long time alongside other activities. So the aims are um, to enable early career researchers to develop that leadership experience and build your capability as a future leader. Um, also to produce high quality research that kind of moves you beyond the work you did for your doctoral thesis. Um, it does require, for early career researchers, it does require a mentor and um, HSC can make a contribution towards this um, and funding is available between six and 24 months. So there's various different examples you'll see in the funding guide of how that time can be made up and the percentage of your time, so I won't go into that. Um, and you can apply between 50 and 250,000 and that's full economic cost which again I won't go into but if I'm sure you've heard of this so you have to fully cost the project um, and include all the costs of running that project and then AHRC pays 80% of those and your institution signs up to committing 20% of that. Um, the thing to note at the, at the bottom is um, these aren't quick applications. Um, the peer review takes roughly 30 weeks. So we advise you to put a start date that's no earlier than nine months from the time that you submit the proposal to the time that you were here. So that's with them in mind. Um, research grants, again, research grants has a route for early career researchers. So um, Research grant scheme isn't about individual um, research projects, it's very much about um, larger collaborative projects. Um, and the early career route enables researchers at the start of their career to have experience, gain experience of leading these larger research grant projects. Um, again, you must meet the criteria displayed on the other slide. Um, and you can apply for economic costs between 50 and 250,000 and up to 60 months. Again, the thing to note is the time, um, they're not quick um, turnaround time because of the peer review process, so to think about that when you're applying. Um, and for the grants, I'm not sure if this is the same for fellowships, but grants, there's a slightly higher success rate for early career researchers as well to encourage proposals to come through that route. Um, 
Just very briefly on the other schools. So these don't have a route for early career researchers, but they are open to early career researchers. So research networking schemes, um, a small amount of money that we give to support um, networking activities as it says. So the exchange of ideas, so it can be workshops, so series of networks where you look at a particular question. Um, they're only up to 30k and they're just over 24 months. The thing I always say about the networking scheme is it's a really good um, platform to do some research to and explore an idea or a series of questions before you then go on to the larger grants. So quite often we'll see that, we'll see some of the initial research and investigation done through a networking grant that then leads on to um, a larger research grant. And obviously the reviewers, when they come to look at the proposals for the large grant, if you're able to reference work that's already been done through perhaps a networking grant, um, then that is only going to benefit your, your application. So it's a really good scheme, has quite high success rate as well. Um, Follow-on funding for in impact engagement is only open to those people who have held a HSC grant already. Um, so it enables them to apply for um, a small amount of additional money, um, particularly to look at um, areas of engagement, um, impact, that kind of wasn't identified in the original proposal, so things that happen through the grant that you can then go on and do a bit more work around. Um, so other funding, as I've mentioned, particularly um, for heritage, um, comes up a lot in the Global Challenges Research Fund, Newton, HERA, and um, the Joint Program Initiative on Cultural Heritage. So there's always opportunities in there. Um, we have a call out under the JPI at the moment actually for conservation, preservation and use. The closing date is September. Um, and the move to UK and our UK has enabled us um, to develop new opportunities. Um, so through the Industrial Challenge Fund, but also the Strategic Priorities um, Fund is a pot of money that UKRI have that all the councils can bid into um, for projects and we've just been going through the process of the, the second sort of round of that so there'll be some things coming out publicly in the autumn. Um, and then we also have our postgraduate provision which is mainly through the collective doctoral partnerships and the doctoral training partnerships. Um, so that was very quick, it was a very, very quick overview, um, but um, I can't stay for the whole of the day, unfortunately, but I will be around until after lunch, so if any of you have any questions, then feel free to come and grab me at some point. So, thank you. I'm the Council Lead for AHRC in the UKRI Future Leaders Fellowship Scheme, or FLF, and that's not even the beginning of the acronyms. <laughs> As Karen's mentioned, AHRC has, since the 1st of April last year, been part of a kind of umbrella organisation called UKRI, and AHRC, along with the seven other research councils that you can really have heard of, Innovate UK, which funds um, innovative activities in UK registered businesses, and elements of what used to be a higher education funding council for England, now Badgers Research England. So they're all together in one building in Swindon, if you're ever in the area, do come and visit. The aim of UKRI is to improve cross council working, harmonise policy and practice, help us to share data a bit better to sort of understand what the UK uh, research landscape looks like and to provide a stronger voice so that um, hopefully that will translate into more funding. AHRC's remit is quite broad, as Karen has mentioned. Here's just a few of our top level classifications. Um, you'll see there is no, I don't think we have a heritage category, but archaeology is in there as is history, and um, certainly recognise heritage as one of the sort of research areas that we fund quite a lot. The Future Leaders Fellowship Scheme was born at the same time as UKRI. It's a UKRI scheme, it's our CEO's baby, and it's £900 million worth of funding to be spent over three years making 550 fellowships award, not awards of up to £1.2 million. Pounds. It's a large machine and um, it's only sort of one and a bit years old now. 
It's open to researchers and innovators from across the Arena and Summit Councils and Innovate UK. So you can apply, uh, you know, you can apply under sort of AHRC or under EPSRC or under NERC for those of you who might have held or applied for NERC awards in the past. You just apply to the scheme and then we sort it out internally who's going to provide peer reviewers and panelists. It's administered by a central team which are independent of any of the councils and as I say we provide the expertise in peer review and panel selection. There's no ring fence budget for councils. That means that there aren't a set number of EPSRC aligned awards or a set number of AHRC awards. Theoretically, all 550 of those awards could be for Martin Humanities researchers. <coughs> Fantastic. There's no, also no ring fence for organization types, so um, no particular group or um, HEI or sort of business type, and there's no ring fencing by subject areas as well. There are currently no highlight notices and no plans for highlight notices, so it's come on top all. It's now the career, uh, early career scheme, and the, design, the, the uh, intention is to help early career researchers to become research leaders. So you don't have to demonstrate that you're already in your field, just that you have the potential to become so. So the scheme is designed to help you do that. Um, the objectives are, first and foremost, the development of the fellow. So this is designed to sort of propel you from um, sort of, uh, an excellent early career researcher to a world leader in your field and obviously to fund the world-class research and or innovation. We have to include that bit because innovate upon the scheme. The ECR specification is not the same as AHRC's. It's self-defined. You use a competency framework method, so it doesn't matter if you're 5, 10, 15, however many years post-PhD, or if you're still writing up and yet submit your PhD. Um, you can still apply if you be postdoctoral at the time of applying, or if you have equivalent research or sort of uh, industry experience. I'd say Dr. Equivalent is the only real sort of benchmark uh, application criterion. Another important criterion is demonstrable support from your host organization. So they have to support your salary and tapered status from year three onwards, and they have to promise you an open ended contract at the end in a role that sort of is uh, appropriate for the status that you'll have at that point. And also, again, 80%, we support 80% of the total economic cost they in 20. So it can be quite an expensive scheme for uh, research organizations to fund, which is why at times, if you decide to apply for the scheme, you might face some reticence from uh, certain senior members of your department. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is sort of the person specification bit. This is what, um, how we define the kind of candidate that we're looking for and that we advise our peer reviewers and our panels to look for. So, demonstrable knowledge of the research area and a vision for the research that you're going to create. Uh, some idea of the pathways to the impact or influence or um, uh, the value that your research is going to add, um, very, very broadly speaking. Original and ambitious plans that don't overlap with the kind of previous collaborators or your PhD supervisors or um, anyone else that you've worked with in the past. Um, the suitability of the research environment, which is not necessarily something that you can do much about, but it's up to you in your application to make it play why the research organization in which you are going to carry out this fellowship is the best in the world for, or the best that you can uh, get to for what you want to do. And you have to demonstrate that you're capable of leadership. This doesn't necessarily mean you've been a department head or that you've head up, led up a research team. There's all kinds of ways that you can define your leadership, and we're going to get to that a little bit later. Um, you also need to demonstrate the ability to build partnerships, collaborations, networks. These are all on the website, so I won't read them through in exhaustive detail. It's just to make it clear to you that these are the sort of things that you can demonstrate in a fairly narrative format or through your CV, um, rather than saying, um, yes or no, I am at this uh, point post PhD. And um, the assessment criteria are also on the website, so again, I won't go through these in a huge amount of detail, but obviously, research excellence is a big one. Um, you and your academic track record, your research track record, um, the traits that you're able to demonstrate that you uh, possess or that you've um, used. Um, and impact and strategic relevance is one thing I will highlight because that can throw people. Um, Robin's given you a fantastic example of the heritage strategy to which you can refer. In fact, the heritage is a priority area for AHRC, that will stand you in good stead. And the criteria for impact that in UKRI have published are. Uh, what is it? So economic, social, and I've forgotten. Um, they're quite broad anyway. You can probably find a place in your research where your research fits into one of those. 
Um, the research around environment and cost, as I say, you need to demonstrate a strong cost commitment, and that needs to be tailored to what you want to achieve. So if there's specific skills development activities, if they can provide them, they need to kind of outline all that in their letter of support. And um, if you're going to be collaborating with other departments, either in your research organization or in other research organizations, that's helpful to, to spell out as well. Um, you should uh, make sure that your funding obviously is watertight and um, a senior colleague in uh, your department or who's held a research grant in the past or your church office can help you with that. And um, this is the assessment. Um, <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> this is the stuff that you don't see, this goes on backstage, as it were. Um, so it's a three-stage assessment process. There's obviously peer review, which is part of the course. You'll be given the opportunity with this scheme to suggest up to three peer reviewers who you think would be a good fit for your scheme. There's no guarantee that we'll pick them because we do a little bit of searching to make sure that they're a good fit for the project and to make sure they're not conflicted, they're not your best friend. Um, and then we will contact a number of reviewers in your field, um, working with other councils if necessary, to make sure that your project receives at least three good usable reviews. There's a PI response stage, so you'll have the opportunity to read through these, respond to comments, criticisms, uh, in as pleasant way as you can. And then these go to a moderating panel. The moderating panels are large and they're interdisciplinary. They're grouped by theme, so a um, heritage proposal might fit into a theme that's, um, say, uh, history and social research, or it might go in, if it's sort of more on the hard sciences end or the environmental sciences end, it might go into a panel that's more around the environment. And uh, we suggest in various panels, jointly with our council colleagues, that vaguely resemble the uh, composition of the proposals that are going to it. The result of that will be a shortlist. Um, if you make the cut of that shortlist, you go forward to an interview panel, which is a whole separate ordeal. Um, these are smaller panels, they will bring you in front of them and they'll ask you questions about your plan for the fellowship, your leadership capability, um, your sort of, uh, your plans for your career development and how the fellowship will take them forward. It's a, a so getting to know you and then assessing how sort of credible you are as a candidate, if you like. As there are 550 awards to be made, we've made, I think, 40, 47 or 46 in the first round of which there's one, and there's capability to make up to 100 awards in subsequent rounds. Uh, the awards can be up to seven years, uh, four plus three years, so you get four years initially, which is what that 1.2 million pounds will pay for. And then after four years, there'll be a second stage where you're brought back for another sort of mini assessment or discussion, and you can at that stage bid for up to three years further funding to take forward research activities, to take forward impact or sort of engagement activities, depending on where you are in fellowship. It's really quite flexible. Unusually for many UKRI funding schemes, three submissions are permitted, so if you're unsuccessful in round uh, well, say you uh, submitted to round one and you've been unsuccessful, it may be too late for round two because they slightly overlap, but you could then reapply for round three, provided that you include a cover letter that demonstrates that you've acted on the feedback from the panel, the and that this project is sufficiently different that it, you're not just sending in exactly the same thing and probably going to end up with exactly the same result. And parallel submissions are permitted by some councils, so you can submit a proposal to uh, AHRC Leadership Fellows, for example, and the UKRI Future Leaders Fellowships, if you want to sort of hedge your bets. The timetable for these is, say, there's two per year. Round one is complete, round two is closed, and we're waiting on the outcomes any day now. Uh, round three is closed, and we're currently assessing it internally. You've got round four coming up this uh, October. Round five, uh, I would imagine it's going to be April, May next year, and round six, which will open in September 2020 and close probably the end of October. These timetables are published on the UKRI website, and there's a link through to that from the AHRC website, along with a little bit of additional information, which I've drafted to sort of break down exactly the differences between the UKRI FLF and Leadership Fellows, which is the AHRC scheme, um, in case you are unsure exactly where you're going to apply. This is a quotation from uh, Professor Marie Sweet, who was our Director of Partnerships and Engagement, and unfortunately is no longer with us, which just outlines what an excellent opportunity this is for early career researchers in the arts and humanities because of the length and the flexibility and the sort of prestigiousness of the uh, scheme, and um, it gives you an opportunity to recognize your potential. Sorry, I had to fly through that, we're running just about on time. Uh, I will be around as Karen is for the rest of the day and happy to answer any questions I'm sort of floating about between the tables, so do grab me. And I'm sure you'll receive a copy of these slides after the workshop is over.